it, it is amazing how people think there is such a thing as overnight success simply because these, uh, like The Voice, America's Got Talent, all these, you know, they instantaneously s discover people. Well, just because they were instantly discovered doesn't mean they didn't spend 10 years, you know, honing their craft in the dark before you shine a light on them. You know, what happens to, to us, we compare ourselves to like the celebrity or the star in our space, and it's an unrealistic comparison. And today we have John Brubaker with us. John is a nationally renowned performance consultant, speaker and author, and uh, he's just fun to talk to. His sixth book is called Stadium Status. And Stadium Status is, the, is that place that every coach, athlete, entertainer, and performer strives to reach. It's how to fill a stadium. And I was super excited to read his book. I highly recommend it to you. Um, and really think about how to take it beyond the person filling the stadium but to brands and what are the lessons from stadium status we can take into our marketing. Uh, and I think you really enjoy this conversation with John Brubaker. John Brubaker, welcome to Focus is Your Friend. What's up, Lee? How are you? Thanks for having me. <laughs> I am so pumped to talk with you today. So John's new book, Stadium Status, which I talked to you about a little earlier, um, is awesome, and I highly recommend it to you. And I'm so thankful that he took some time today to talk with us. So, John, what is stadium status? Stadium status def is defined by those scholars at uh, that scholarly journal you may have heard of, UrbanDictionary.com. <laughs> it's defined as to be a big enough star that you could fill an entire stadium when performing a concert. You know you're big once you've achieved, quote, stadium status. Got it. So it's Usher, Tom Brady. Lee Carraher. Lee Carraher, John, John Brubaker. Awesome. Yeah, it's just the four of us. <laughs> as long as that stadium is really small, I can fill it. <laughs> well, I, I really believe, well, I really believe you could, but I also really believe stadium status on some le level is a goal that resides in all of us, not just the musicians or the, you know, the Tom Brady's of the NFL. I think it's every entrepreneur, every business person. You know, I know it's a goal that's motivated me and my careers and my clients. And, and I know you're a kindred spirit with that, but I think everybody wants, everybody wants to achieve stadium status. Yeah. We have um, a desire to be known. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting, you know, so you talk a lot about entrepreneurs and individuals, but I really think that the, you know, having read your book, that from a marketing perspective, you know, every marketer should be thinking about this stuff all the time, right? Absolutely. The game's changed. The game has changed. And if you're not changing the game, if you're staying the same, then you're getting left behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you think about, um, you know, applying the strategies of athletes and musicians um, to marketing or to company management, tell me more about, you know, how, why and then how um, we can do that. Sure. And when I say stadium status performers, I don't just mean entertainers and athletes. Right. What I mean are it's anyone who calls the stadium their office. So you could be Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks of Shark Tank fame. Uh, you could be anybody you know, at Apple. I mean, Apple calls yeah. a press conference and there's, you know, I'm in San Francisco today and Apple calls a press conference and, you know, thousands of people are waiting to be in the standing room only places, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you know, anyone that has a stadium sized audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, and so basically, which is any and marketer, focus, right? Focus, focus not being my friend. I forget your question. <laughs> <laughs> Look, squirrel. <laughs> so squirrel, please. I don't know if you've seen a presentation of mine, but I do have that slide from the movie up in there. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> my point is, you know, so we, uh, you know, uh, stadium status is mostly we think about individuals when we're talking mm -hmm. about that. But I think your point is in your book, it's not, it's about companies like companies need to think about marketing teams need to be thinking about products driving stadium status 
Absolutely. companies. And um, and when you think about how does it change the way you think about marketing? It changes the way you think about marketing because focus needs to be your friend. And let me explain what I mean. Do you see what I just did there? I did. I'm so impressed. Thank you. So when you think of Harley Davidson, do you think of cologne? Do you think of perfume? Mm-hmm. No. Well, no. Think, I think of a smell, of? but not that. <laughs> You think of this iconic brand of motorcycles and, you know, the the biker jacket. And the sound, the Harley sound. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you know they came out with a cologne? I did not. Yeah. So it's, when I think of stadium status for a brand, it's really about staying in your lane. You remember when McDonald's came out with pizza? Right. No, ES- I don't know yeah. that. They did. ESPN had the ESPN cell phone. You're not a cellular provider. You are the place people turn to for sports. So I think brands have a tendency to, well, I'll just go ahead and use the word. They have a tendency to get greedy to a detriment. And they think that by diversifying, they're going to capture more market. What they're really doing is they're not diversifying. It's a different D it's called dilution. They're diluting brand and what they stand for and what they're known for. This is why, John, you and I need to go on the road and talk about how to stay in your lane and focus. <laughs> I mean, seriously. What'd you uh, say? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do believe that the inability for a brand to collectively focus and have a, a dominant focus is to a detriment because you think about the society we live in, and the the economy we live in, I should say, we're in an attention economy. And how do you gain and maintain someone's attention? It's being known for one thing, first and foremost. Yeah, so true. It's sort of, you know, when um, we talk about a vision of a company being like five words, ten words max, because it tells you exactly what they imagine their world to be. And why everybody wakes up every day. And when you think about, you know, some of these very corporate easy, you know, the language, like all over the map and the mission statement is like five paragraphs long. Like, who knows why they're showing up every day? But it, you know, it's the same kind of thing, right? It's the same kind of thing. When you have an aspirational vision or mission that is so much larger than yourself, you're shooting for it. You're shooting for the big thing, not like all these little things that are distracting along the way. Absolutely. I think if you ask most employees in organizations today, if they could recite the mission statement, yeah, you'll they're going to stare at you like you have a third eyeball growing out of your <laughs> forehead because they're so confused by their own company's mission statement. And if it's not, you know, five to 10 words, as you said, top of mind, if your employees don't know it, they can't execute it. It ends up just being a motto to see on the wall, or on the office, or on the letterhead, or on the homepage, and it's not a model yeah. to I think, see. It's a motto, and right. it just rings hollow. I think a mission statement should be rally cries, and so, um, you know, because it really helps you motivate. And, you know, at Double Forte, our mission is to help our clients be great. It's really simple. Um, and I could ask everybody here because, you know, I knock it in their heads all the time, but you know, what am I here for? I'm going to help our clients be great. Done. (laughs) Right. Anyway, we could talk a lot about that. Um, tell me about Garth Brooks and how he uses the extra tickets. He, you know, the tickets he doesn't sell. Oh, um, well, it's not that he doesn't sell them. Oh, sorry. So it's that he buys them. And let me explain what I mean. So, are you a country? First of all, are you a country music I fan? I do like country music, although I don't listen very often because I don't listen to anything. I listen to podcasts and news all gotcha. the time. <laughs> That's my business. <laughs> so, a lot of the examples I share in the book and in my speaking come from country music. And the reason why you mentioned Garth Brooks is I believe that genre of music has a far greater direct personal connection between the artist and their audience. I don't mean their collective audience. I mean, individually. And they find a way to make a personal connection yeah. in a very impersonal business in a very, at a very impersonal time that we're living in. So if you've never seen Garth Brooks in concert, if someone's listening right now and they have seen Garth, they're nodding their head up and down with what right. I'm about to say. So, 
at some point in the show, no matter where you're sitting, you feel like he is singing and looking directly at you. And there's a reason for that. So in order to share with you what he does with the tickets, I have to share this first, the little story. I, and it doesn't matter what size venue he's in. I've seen him in Pittsburgh and little Mellon arena, uh, back in the day. And I also saw him in central park and like the biggest venue he's ever played in with, I think, you know, like 4 million other people. And I was in the back of the park and I was in the, the cheap seats in Mellon arena. And regardless of where you were, you felt like he was singing to you at one point. Um, and there's a reason for that, Lee. It's because the morning of the show, he sits in that obstructed view seat in the nosebleeds, the worst seat in the house in whatever venue he's touring at. And he looks at the stage while the crew is loading everything in and setting up the lights and the mics and everything. And he's not micromanaging them from afar, or spying on them. What he's doing is he's getting the worst customer's perspective. The person paid the least you know, that general admission seat behind the post or the pole or, you know, the backs against the wall. And he wants to see how they view him down on stage later that night. And that helps him make a connection with them. Remember, hmm. you know, his small customers, you know, everyone's so focused on the front row right, in right. their business, the key accounts, you know, uh, they tend to forget about the small orders, the small clients. Yeah. Uh, so he does that, but Garth takes it a step further. And now fasten your seatbelt. Here's where the tickets come in. What he does is the night of the show, he'll send an usher up to that obstructed view set of seats and he'll have them take the flashlight out and tap the guy on the shoulder sitting there. Hey, I, I need to see your seats. I think you're in the wrong seats. So if you're this like family of three or four, you're looking at your tickets and you turn around, and look over your shoulder and there's a cinder block wall and you're thinking, like, right. does it get worse than this? <laughs> so it's really almost theatrical what they do. And the usher will then point down on the stage, like stage left or wherever Garth's standing. He'll say, uh, excuse me, but Mr. Brooks sent me up here to get you. Your seats are down there with him tonight. Oh, my gosh. So, so great. What, yeah. So like worst seat in the house to the best seat in the house. What Garth has done is he he buys a set of tickets at every single tour stop. It's written into his contract. He's paying for them. And he is treating a family that probably screwed blue collar family. It probably scraped and saved for six months to take their family out. When you add it all up, it's an expensive night for anybody. And he's treating them to a night they'll never forget that they never thought they were going to get. But what's really cool about that is he takes it a step further. Right when you didn't think it could get any better if you're one of those folks. So when I saw him in Pittsburgh, uh, there's a little girl that she and her family got moved up to the front row. She had a flower with her. She had a rose. They were in the nosebleeds, and she brought a flower for Garth Brooks, ah, thinking she sake. would get to see him and give it to him. Like, that's crazy, you know? She actually did. She had no idea she was going to get a front row seat. So in the middle of the set, she hands him a flower. At the end of the song, he stops, takes off his guitar, hands her his guitar. Oh, like a, my goodness. Several thousand dollars you know, of the highest quality guitar. Stagehand comes out with a Sharpie. He signs it, gives it to her. So you talk about like, just changing, like, what can we learn from that? It's changing your worst customer's perspective of you and your brand and also delivering, over-delivering such a mind-blowing experience. You think about how many people they're going to go tell that story to. It didn't even happen to me, and I tell that story every time I speak. Exactly. In every interview. I wrote about it in the book. Yeah, but like, that's why I wanted so, you to talk about it because yeah, I think it's so up, interesting. My takeaway is how can you do that? How can you make one of your smallest accounts feel like a key account? How, you know, who are you giving your guitar to, so to speak? Right. Well, I think that's so interesting because you use the word worst customer versus least affluent customer or, you know, least expensive customer, something like that. Because that is how marketers think they're my worst customers. They don't yep. spend any money. Da, 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 da. But you also talk about, 
you know, if they scraped it all together, this is where they put their resources. They've been looking for it. It's like going to Disneyland for a lot of people, right? You know, Make-A-Wish, which is the organization that gives grants wishes to dying children, basically, critically and um, critically sick children, most of whom are on, you know, might die. Absolutely. They give over 70% of their wishes are about going to Disneyland, right? And mm-hmm. they... And every single one of those kids, the red carpet comes out. But they're not spending any money. You know, so Disney has the same kind of thing with that. But the the love that comes from that, because this is everything. These child, This child might die. And they're spending, they just want to go to Disneyland. They just want to meet the princesses. Or they just want to meet, you know, Goofy or whatever, you know. And when you understand how much your customer loves you, by spending their money with you, you know, when that becomes your focus as opposed to who spent the most, who, let me see who spent, who's, you know, what's the lifetime value of that customer over time, blah, 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 blah. And it's, if it's purely transactional, you are missing out on how to create um, advocacy and love for your brand in the world. And and the best way I want to piggyback on that for a second, because I think we're all in that story and here's how, uh, the best way I could share it with you is to just share my experience with the quote, you know, customer that scrapes and save or, or the person with limited means. You know, my readers uh, put, you know, we put together a Kickstarter campaign to get my last book adapted to a screenplay. We raised $33,000 in 30 days. And my experience with this crowdfunding campaign was that the people who could afford to give the least gave the most wow respective you know compared yeah, to what right. they what they what they have to give they gave the most because they know what it's like to want and they know what it's like to need and it's their way of showing you love and some of the you know some of the very affluent my quote key accounts if you want to call them that who could afford to you know they could have single-handedly scratched the check and bankrolled the whole thing you know, gave a little bit, but you know, it wasn't much. You know, yeah. it, it was Token. it was a drop in the bucket to them. So, like, if you change and shift your perspective on your smallest customers to understand that, in some way, like emotionally, they're really giving the most. They are scraping and saving and showing you love that some of your big customers aren't because they're not emotionally invested. It's just a transaction to some big customers. I mean, if you if you have you know you could take a very um, you know a trans you know understanding transactional point of view around the goodwill right what's the goodwill factor for everybody the goodwill factor for um, this family that moved down from you know right behind the cinder block onto the stage or stage right or whatever it is you know the goodwill transaction on that is you couldn't measure. Right. Well, you no. could measure because you, you'd be able to see something, but you couldn't measure the infectiousness of it because of the speaking. But if you think if, if it's all you're measuring is the dollar amount and not the promotional amount, then you're missing the boat. You're missing the boat on how people are advocates today. And every person can hurt you or help you or be neutral. And uh, you never want them to be in the hurt pile. But, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to get them into the plus pile. And th- that transaction matters, too, in marketing, I think. Absolutely. It's a little thing that makes a big difference, the ability to move the needle over in that direction. I thought it was interesting what you said about um, country music stars. So, you know, I've been to lots of concerts and the meet and greet that the country music stars or not even the star, you know, people who are up and comers, yep. the meet and greet that's built into their days is just so extraordinary in every concert I've been to. Um, and you see in the crossover, like Taylor Swift, what she does for her, you know, she's not in that category anymore. You know, she's over in the pop category, but what she does for her fans is pretty huge. Right. But it's oh, she sends she sends them birthday presents. Yeah. She finds out their birthday. Yeah. Exactly. So um, which is why I think um, I think your point, you make it in the book, the point, you know, they have longer staying power than so many other uh, categories. Celine Dion's another person, I think, you know, she is such a generous performer. You know, um I mean, she works. I mean, you can tell if someone's working hard or not, right? Mm, absolutely. <laughs> She's such a generous performer that you know she can sing the same song like ninety-two times. And people will show up ninety-two times. You know. <laughs> no doubt. All right. Um, talk to me about 
overnight successes because we see this all the time in Silicon Valley. Like they came out of nowhere. They're the starlings. I'm like, and you know, we always like we want to be them. All right. This is what you have to do to be them. So talk to me about overnight successes. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's overnight success is very much a very real thing, Lee. It just happens night overnight overnight (laughs) for about 10 years before they arrive. And, you know, the the lights and and the big cameras are on them. Uh, it, It is amazing how people think there is such a thing as overnight success simply because these uh, like America, the voice America's got talent, all these kind of star search. You remember star search from oh the eighties dating search. myself a bit, Yeah, but like, you know, they instantaneously s- discover people. Well, just because they were instantly discovered doesn't mean they didn't spend 10 years, you know, honing their craft in the dark before you shine a light on them. <laughs> it's just, it's what, it's what the media does though. And, uh, you know what happens to 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 us? Uh, I'm not a household name. I'm not. I, I'm not even a household name in my own household. But <laughs> well, they call you dad, hap- so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, but what happens is we compare ourselves to like the celebrity or the star in our space, and it's an unrealistic comparison because like you're comparing. What you're comparing your blooper reel, if you're in Happily, right. to their ESPN highlight reel, you know. Uh, if you're an entertainer or, you know, you're uh, an entrepreneur trying to get stadium status, you're comparing all your backstage stuff to their front stage, center stage in some cases, where you just see the polished, refined, very honed, rehearsed, um, photoshopped, airbrushed, you know, auto-tuned within an inch of its life version of this person. And it's an unrealistic comparison that just, it's the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy that steals your peace of mind and your confidence. When in reality, everybody's screwed up in different ways and everyone's far from perfect. I think the, the stars that do have staying power are the ones who, uh, remain authentic and they're not they're not trying to be perfect do you remember when oprah's ratings dropped like they plummeted i can't remember when when it was what was that tell you it was when she lost all that weight oh right she was and her audience looked at her and they're like she's really not like us you know she had marketed herself as and she was very authentic i'm just like you and then all of a sudden one day you know Overnight. 89 pounds <laughs> she, later. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't relate to her. Right. Well, everyone can relate to her now because she yo-yos like the rest of us. Yeah, so. <laughs> absolutely. But it's, I just think it's, it says a lot for just being you, you know? Everyone's trying so hard to, to, to be the next, you know, insert the celebrity in your space. Don't be the next, be the best. And what I mean by the best is the best. It's the best version of you. Right. Or you're... No com- one... It's no so, one can duplicate that. Because you we see that in the media a lot, right? The Warby Parker of, the Uber of, the da 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 of, the you know, the Airbnb of. And um and it's a business plan. You know, it is a business plan in Silicon Valley. We want to be the film, you know, Warby, whatever it is, of whatever category it is. And um by definition, if you're that you're trying to do that, you are playing someone else's game, right? Uh yeah. and someone else's game you can't beat someone else at their own game that they perfected. You should play your own game to, you know, to win the war. Um, and I find with our clients, at least, um, who we do a lot of counseling, particularly with startups, we're like, we want to be this or that. We're here to disrupt this industry. We're going to do, you know, this is how we're, you know, the business plan reads just like that. We're going to be the, you know, fill in the blank of whatever category. And we try to, you know, one, if we can't get people off that page, we usually don't work with them because nothing we can do will make them happy. Right. Nothing. We we want to be in the zeitgeist. Well, you can't, you know, working to be in the zeitgeist versus working to sell your product, two very different things. 
Um, and first you should sell some product uh, so you can have some money to be in the zeitgeist. But the zeitgeist doesn't drive product, right? And everyone, for, you know, this is sort of the idea of the overnight success, I think. Like all of a sudden Uber shows up and they've been plowing away. I don't really like Uber, the company. I love the product is fantastic, but the company I think is terrible. And I've talked mm-hmm. about that before. Um, but, you know, they're plowing away for six years before they even, you know, were known for something, right? And at first they were known for bringing puppies to offices just so they could get attention. And they were great at it, great at it. Um, But six years of trying to get things out the ground before, (laughs) you know, they didn't get to be the zeitgeist out of nothing, right? They sold their product, sell the product first, and then it becomes. But then the copycats, I want to be in the zeitgeist stuff. I want to be part of everything. Well, you're part of nothing if you're part of everything, if you have nothing to, you know, if you have nothing to stand on other than just being a a star chaser. So I don't want to be the Airbnb of authors (laughs) or the Uber of professional speaking. (laughs) You don't. No, I just, I just want to be John Brubaker. Really, I want to be be Lee Carroher. You want to be John Brubaker, professional success, you know, stadium success. I mean, that's... I think when we focus on what we are gifted with uh, as individuals or as companies uh, or as product lines or whatever the heck it is, or service providers, that's when we can succeed. Um, well, here's a great, here's a great example for you, Lee. You mentioned being in the zeitgeist and the best way to be in the zeitgeist is to not try and be <laughs> in the zeitgeist. So and true. here's what I mean. You know, this isn't a political statement or rant by any means. It's just an example. Ronald Reagan was an actor, and he was a stadium status actor, but he left Hollywood to become president. He was a governor, then he became president. What was really cool about Reagan, though, was he refused to wear makeup on TV because that's not how his constituents are used to seeing it. It wasn't authentic. They asked him, uh, Michael Deaver, his chief of staff, asked him to take off his blazer and sling it over his shoulder for a photo op. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not me. The public would know that's just a total fraud. And there's a lot to be said for just being your authentic self. And that's you'll never have to worry about being misrepresented. You know, one of the things I really respect and admire about bands that I go see uh, and country and artists that go you see all lot. need to follow John because he seems a lot of bands, a lot of bands. This guy is out there. <laughs> so I, I think what is the, the mark of true success is when you listen to somebody's song on the radio or on iTunes, and then you go see them live and it sounds exactly the same, but you know what? You know why that's so remarkable? Because it's so infrequent. Right. Oh, my gosh. You're actually getting this scrubbed within an inch of its life, polished version with... Um, Auto-tune you know, on it. Yeah. yeah auto I mean, oh, my gosh. The session drummers and guitarists, not the actual band members in the studio recording. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for the artists that when you go see them live, you're like, you know what? I was just listening to them on the radio on the way here, and it sounds exactly the same. That's fearless authenticity, and that's creating a brand that's congruent. There's so much incongruence today that people are struggling to understand, you know, what you stand for. But you make that if you're intentionally congruent, that's a huge competitive advantage. There are no surprises. Yeah, so true. And um I have so many other questions that are running out of time, but let me ask a couple, let me ask specific questions that I think will really resonate with um, our audience. Which there's, is, there's one question you really have to ask. And it's the last question I sent you. Okay. Hold on. I got to turn the page. Because your, your listeners are dying to know. Okay. Number 18, so, you mean? So if we don't have time for anything else. It's okay. the question that has your name in it, Lee. See it. <laughs> so why don't, why don't you ask you me the question? Me ask, I'll ask, <laughs> ask the last yourself question. a question, but let me ask before you get that one. I want to ask one other. I mean, I'm going to ask questions. Talk about um, so in traditional, you know, in marketing, audience is it trumps everything. Like who are you trying to go after? And often, um, you know, people say it's men, 55 to 72, or boys, 12 to 17, or women. 
uh, 25 to 55. And, you know, I sort of look at when people say that to me, I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, that's just so huge. Um, talk to me about narrow casting versus broadcasting and, um, and what the lessons are from, um, particularly musicians around how to focus on those super fans. Absolutely. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. So I think marketers, companies, we all brands, we all fall in one of two categories. You're either a U2 marketer, like the band U2, or you're an Eric Church marketer. Ah, uh -huh. And what I mean by that is there's a uh, stadium status country artist named Eric Church. And the difference between U2 and Eric Church is the difference between broadcasting and narrow casting. So I don't know if you remember when U2 released their last album. September 2014, you got it jammed onto your iTunes account right. without mm -hmm. your consent. You know, the album's called Songs of Innocence, and they put it on half a billion iTunes users' accounts. I'm a U2 fan. And I was offended by that. I really kind of felt like my personal technology, you know, my account was violated. That That's not permission marketing, you know. Um, but what they did was, you know, it was supposed to be intended as a gift, but they violated our trust by invading our devices. And the reason they did that was U2 is operating out of fear. You know, before the album was released and they knew they were bringing out new music, the critics, everyone speculated like, oh, they're, you know, the brand's kind of dying on the vine. So you two started thinking, well, how many of these albums are we really going to sell? This could get embarrassing. So they just sold it to iTunes who then gave it away. Um, and number one, they sold themselves short. But number two, they cast a very broad net and they that album was... It's like a shotgun blast to a lot of people who weren't fans versus what Eric Church did. And with this is what I highly advise everyone do. Uh, a year later, in November 2015, he secretly released the album the day before the CMA Awards. And the way he did it was he actually had vinyl records. Vinyl. Vinyl. Talk about being different. He had vinyl records pressed in a factory in Europe so no one in the U.S. would, would know catch about wind. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he shipped them with a handwritten note on legal pad, not like nice stationery, on legal pad to each of the members of his fan club known as the Church Choir. How do uh -huh. I know this? Because you're I'm part a of member it. Of the Church Choir, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so – what happened was he gave a gift and he right. wasn't asking for anything in return, but he focused on his fanatics. He did that. That's like having a uh, rifle with a scope and a laser sight yeah. compared to shotgun blast. He knew who he was reaching. And you're thinking like, well, why would you do that when those are the people that would be the first ones to pay for it and buy it when it was released? They don't, no one has a record player. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's there's another whole layer to that in that like <laughs> over Christmas he actually sold an Eric Church record player, but that's oh, well, another conversation. <laughs> but what it did was he created, you know, he took his raving fans, he turned them into advocates. They went on social media, they they YouTube themselves listening to the music, they shared it on Twitter. So it sold 71,000 copies in the first 30 hours it was wow. available. It charted number three on the Billboard Top 100 for all genres. Mm -hmm. Which is extraordinary for country. Extraordinary for country. In extraordinary general, right? for kind of, he's kind of an out, outsider, you know. Yeah, he's, he's, not, not, he's a maverick country. guy, right? Yeah. 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 So it's just a great example of disruptive marketing and how much we started the show with, like how much the game has changed. Yeah, so much. So that's a great example. Um, I I do see your last question <laughs> now, <clears throat> which I will ask. And because uh, everyone's listening to me, I will ask because John asked me to ask it. Uh, so uh, John's question is, why exactly do you think Lee Carraher is already stadium status? She said, blushing. <laughs> we we should have like a drum roll sound effect <laughs> inserted in there. 
here's why Lee Carraher is already stadium status. It's because the most stadium status performers believe in abundance, not scarcity. They don't look at like, you see, we're both authors. You know, they don't look at like, well, you know, I don't want to feature John because that would be cutting into my piece of the pie. Stadium status performers like Lee folks believe the pie is unlimited. There's no pieces of the pie. It's pie is unlimited. They believe a rising tide raises all boats. I've interviewed a lot of CEOs, professional athletes, coaches, entertainers, uh, my clients. This is a belief I have, which is why you and I are kindred spirits. Lee, you believe mm-hmm. in abundance. Mm-hmm. I do. And every single one of them believes that if they do what is best for their industry and if they help their competition, they personally will win and win more. And uh, I'll give you a great small business local example of that. I live in Portland, Maine, and it was just ranked the number one city for craft breweries. There are like 20 craft breweries. They're all on the same street in downtown Portland. Yeah, I've been there. And you you know what they do? What do they do? One of them them runs out of hops, and they go next door, just like you're asking your neighbor, hey, can I borrow a cup of sugar? I ran out. And they loan them hops. Wow. And one of them leases a new beer, they all spread the word about it and share it on social media, you know, in, at their tasting rooms, they feature each other's stuff. And that's why I would argue that's why Portland, which shouldn't be known for craft beer, we ought to be known for lobster, lobster. <laughs> and the, the boating industry and L.L. Right. Bean and yeah. skiing, you know? We're known for craft beer because a rising tide raises all ships. And what's really cool about all that, to bring it home, Lee, is there is a craft brewery in Portland, Maine called Rising Tide. And ah, boy, they make, I love boy, it. Boy, do they make some good stuff. <laughs> but I think that if we all took that approach where you know we help each other out, everybody wins. You know, It's about facilitation instead of manipulation. You're not competing, you're creating. So, you know, to to close it out for you, this is why I think your stadium status is you get that and you're generous and you give and you're over, you over deliver. This podcast is just another great example of that. So thank you. Well, you're very generous as well. Thank you for that. I'm blushing. Oh my goodness. Well, we are totally out of time and, uh, which is making me sad because we have so much more to talk about, but maybe what we'll do, John, I'll have you come back in a few months and we'll talk some more, but um, thank you. tell me, tell everybody where they can find out about your book and, and how to engage with you. You can engage with me and find out about the book all in the same place. You go to stadiumstatusbook.com. Great. And uh, you can find, um, we'll put all these links for what John has done into our show notes. Of course, I highly recommend that you uh, follow him on Twitter. It is uh, entertaining and information and inspirational all at the same time. So I appreciate that a lot. So John, thank you so much for being with us on Focus is Your Friend. I so appreciate your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you, Lee. You're awesome. Wow, that was a great conversation with John. Again, I highly recommend his book to you, Stadium Status. The link to that book will be on the show notes. And just a few things um, I thought. One, I thought the story about how Garth Brooks really focuses on that customer, that that person, that fan who can't spend very much um, and they, they have to take the worst seat in the house, but he empathizes with them and he brings them that just top notch experience and sort of thinking about the value of those kinds of people over time. It's not just a transaction of purchase and the lifetime value of the customer in terms of the dollars, but also thinking about the lifetime value of a customer in terms of the advocacy. And they don't have to make you a lot of money to be a great advocate for you. I thought that was really uh, interesting. Also, the, of course, uh, the idea of the overnight success um, and being the something of, being the Warby Parker of, being the Uber of, being the whatever of. If we focus on doing what we do really well, then we're just going to be so much more successful than trying to play someone else's game, no matter what it is. So... I hope you enjoyed the conversation. John is a great guy. Um, I highly recommend him to you. Um, I think you'll really enjoy his book. 
And if you like what you're hearing, I would love for you to go over to iTunes and give us a rating and a couple stars and a review. It helps other people find us. Uh, and I would really appreciate it. All right, everybody. Until next time, I'm Lee Carraher, and this is Focus is Your Friend. <laughs>